Let's face it, grids are an essential part of game UI design. Whether it's a main menu, a puzzle layout, an inventory screen, or an item selection menu, it's difficult to escape the need for a grid. One of the design trends over the past few years has been to implement multi-platform menus through a tile-based layout with different tabs and panels. I'm a huge fan of this style, and I specifically love seeing how different companies put their own take on it. What's noticeable to me about many of these screens is how the number of tiles in each panel frequently varies and how the layout is adjusted to best fit the number of tiles on display. In the previous video, we looked at how we might be able to emulate these kind of menus by using color palettes and layout groups. Today, we're going to pick up where we left off and look at how we can build our own tile-based flexible menu system. Hi there, I'm Matt and welcome to Game Dev Guide. In this video, we're going to take a look at how we can build a multi-page panel system that can be switched through using tabs and then we're going to look at how we can build out our own grid layout component that automatically arranges its children and builds a grid layout based on the space available. So, we've got the first part of our front end menu here. We've got a canvas with a panel, and the panel is split into two halves. The top part here is going to be our tab area, and the body will be the display for our tiles. So let's get started and build out the tabs for our menu. I'm going to be using a tab system similar to the one discussed in this video, which means that I'm not going to go too much into detail about how this system works in this video. I'll link it down below if you missed it or want a refresher on how it works. I'm going to create a few different tabs here that we can flick through, but to save myself a bit of work, I'm going to design the first one, well, first, and then duplicate it once I'm done with. For ease of design, I'm going to just use a script here to grab the text from the name of the parent game object. In a production scenario, you'd probably pull this text from a localization system, but this is a fine placeholder for now, and so this script stops me constantly fiddling around with various text components. Another important factor in UI design is picking a good font. There are two types of fonts, good fonts, and then everything else. Take a look at the big budget games. You might notice how most of them use really readable fonts, and you might also notice how a lot of them look really similar to one another. This is down to years and years of exposure for us of basically five to six different types of fonts. My suggestion to make something look good is to stick to a common font and stick to one or two throughout your entire UI. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, there's a reason we see the same fonts everywhere. Much like with the color palettes discussed in the last video, consistency is key, so be sure to make some rules for yourself and stick to them. A good rule for text design that I like to abide by is to have one font and weight for headers, such as a bold or heavy weight, perhaps in uppercase, and then another weight of the same font for general prose text. I'm a big fan of Futura, and I picked up Futura PT a while ago. Unless the design calls otherwise, this is a baseline font for all of my projects. So we'll just go ahead here and create a font asset, and now we've got some fonts to work with. I'm going to assign the heavy font here and set it all to uppercase. And the tab settings, I'll assign the image graphic and the text graphic and set the active and inactive colors. And of course, assign it to our tab group. Now let's duplicate this out and name the rest of our tabs like so. This is looking pretty good. I want to emulate a bit of cross-platform support, so I'm actually going to add these lines here to switch tabs back and forth when a specific key is pressed. There's probably a whole other video I could do on input systems and multi-platform stuff. For now, I'm just going to hard code it using Q and E. I'm also going to restructure this bar a little bit to show these two functions in the menu here. In fact, let's swap the image from our main header here to slightly transparent black and round the edges using a sprite. We've got our left and right in here now, so we can add a slight gray divider between our tabs by spacing them out a bit and setting the image on our parent to be gray, like so. With that set up, it's time to organize our body. It's pretty common to want our tabs to control a series of pages or panels. So instead of assigning that logic to each button or tab individually, we can build a little panel controller script that interacts with our tab system and manages each panel, enabling or disabling panels based on which tab is selected. Let's create a script called panel group. At the top here, let's expose an array of game objects to act as our panels. Then let's also expose the tab group that will be linked to our panels. And we'll add an integer to store the index of our currently active page. Let's create a new method called show current panel, which will call on awake. And here we'll loop through the pages and disable anything that isn't our current page. Then let's create a method called set page index that will set the index of our page and call our show current panel method. And then back in our tab group, all we need to do is make a reference to our panel group, and when a tab is selected, call our set page index method. Now I just need to make some children to our panel group here. And then if we take a look, whenever we select a tab in our panel group, 
it enables the corresponding game object for that tab. So we've got our tab logic working and we're ready to switch between pages, which means that it's time to design our panels. I think it's probably worth taking a moment to explain why I've ended up down this road and why, if you're doing any kind of UI work in Unity, this video should hopefully save you a lot of pain. Let's just add a default grid component here and take a look at everything that sucks about it. One of the biggest problems with this component is that it doesn't really behave like the other two. The horizontal group and vertical groups fill their child elements to the size of their container, but the grid component doesn't do that. It requires a predefined input for fixed sizes of cells to set the children, and then based on the space available just lays them out accordingly. And this is okay I guess if you're designing an inventory screen or something, but even then it's still lacking the fundamental features like auto spacing to fill out the rec transform. Honestly it's just a really lackluster component and counterintuitive compared to how the other two work. So what we're going to do is build out our own grid component that behaves more like we'd expect and more like the horizontal or vertical components. This grid component will get the number of children and based on our input settings, figure out how best to size them to fill the space. The end result will be an extremely adaptable and extremely flexible layout component that will make it simple and easy to build grid based layouts. Let's create a new script called flexible grid layout. We'll extend it from the layout group class and implement the interface. Let's add an integer at the top here for our rows and columns. Let's also add a vector 2 to keep track of our cell size. The default method called in a layout group is calculate layout input horizontal. It's a little misleading for our purposes, but we'll be putting all of our layout code in here. First, we'll calculate the number of rows and columns by finding the square root of the number of children in the transform. Next, we'll get the width and height of our container so we know how much space we're able to work with. And then let's define a size for each of our children based off of the info we now have. Then we'll assign these values to the X and Y position of our cell size property. Then we'll create some variables to keep account of our column and row indexes as we lay everything out. In a for loop, we'll iterate over all the children in the rec transform, and we'll find our current row index and our current column index, like so, and then get a reference to our child object. Let's create a reference to an X and Y position using the column and row counts multiplied by the width and height. And then finally, call the setChildAlongAxis method for each axis. We've now got a system that lays out a grid relative to the number of children. So this is a good start, but there's a few issues. We need to be able to add some spacing between the elements, and we also need to be able to support padding around the edges. At the top of our script, let's add a new vector2 called spacing. Then let's add the spacing to the positioning code here. This is okay, but notice how when we add spacing to our component, we're actually just overflowing our elements here. So what we want to do is reduce the width and height of each of our cells, relative to the spacing we're adding. So where we're setting our cell width and height, let's reduce both of these relative to our spacing. Now, when we add the spacing, the children remain contained within our transform. Next, we just need to add the padding. This will require a similar behavior to our spacing. If we just offset the X and Y position of our cells relative to the padding values, we'll have the same problem where we're just shifting everything across. So we need to reduce the width and height of our cells relative to the padding values too. Now we should have a basic grid layout that fits uniformly and supports both spacing and padding. Awesome. So already we've got what I would consider a more functional grid layout tool, but I think we could do a little bit more to take it that little bit further in functionality by adding a bit more flexibility for different types of layouts. Right now we're scaling uniformly based on the number of children. We've always got the same number of columns and rows, but let's also add support to prioritize one over the other. Let's create an enum in our script called fit type and define an entry for uniform, width, and height. The idea here is that when we're uniform and setting our columns based on the square root of our grid, we often end up with a lot of empty space after a certain number of children. So by picking a priority along the width or height of the transform, we can actually make more use of the space. To do this, we just need to add a check for the current fit type, and for our height, divide the values by the rows, or for our width, divide by our number of columns. Now, if we assign a fit type in the inspector and make sure we have a non-square amount of children, our layout is much more adaptive. But oh no dear viewer, we're not done just yet, this can still be more useful. Automatic layouts are nice, but there are obviously some screens that you're going to want to tile, but have more control over. Perhaps you want to fill the space, but you want to limit the grid to a fixed number of columns and just have the rows be generated automatically. Or perhaps you only want two rows and are happy implementing a horizontal scroll with your tiles overflowing. In our script, let's add two new entries to our fit type, fixed rows and fixed columns. Let's also create a boolean for each axis called fit x and fit y. Now we've got a few changes to make depending on these settings. 
Let's wrap our row and column calculations into an if statement to check that we're in one of these auto types, and then let's set the fit x and fit y to true if any of these are enabled. Otherwise, let's check if we're in fixed rows or fixed columns mode. Then we'll just set the rows and columns accordingly. Next, we want to be able to have control over our cell size if we're in either of these new modes. So when we're designating our cell width and height to our vector, let's check if they're set to fit. If they are, we'll use the auto width and auto height layout. With that, we pretty much have an extremely multi-use layout component. If we switch into our new fixed row or fixed column count, it can even behave like the standard horizontal or vertical layout groups. With all this pretty much laid out, you might still be wondering how we'd go about splitting the layout up even more to get some variations of tile sizes, much like the menus we've looked at as reference. It's pretty common to want variation like this, as you may want to draw the players to a specific point in a menu or prioritize certain tiles over others. Originally, I thought about creating some crazy functionality to adjust individual sizes and scales based on layout elements on the children, but eventually I realized that we can actually just double down on the component. As you can see, if we just treat it like a usual layout group and nest these components, we can create more variation to the layout without any extra work. As a final touch, I've just added some tweening animations to my text and UI components here to give the menu a little bit of juice as we switch between the layouts. Overall, I'm really happy with how well this has come together. The script may or may not help you in your endeavors, but as you can see from the menu we've built, it's a hell of a lot more useful than the built-in grid component. I'm sure there's a lot more you can do with it, and I encourage you to play around with the idea to see what kind of other layout features you can add. And that's all from me for now. Let me know if this video has been helpful in the comments down below. The last video kind of blew up, and there's a hell of a lot more of you here now, so awesome, thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying the videos. That said, the stats still show me that there are 70% of you who are watching that aren't subscribed, so you know who you are and you know what to do. If you're interested in more videos from me, perhaps try checking out some of the others on screen now. But as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.